everybody again. I'm so sorry that we're starting so late, um, but um, I'm really, really excited to share this series with you. This series is the heart of Christianity. This series, honestly, is the game changer of Christianity. This is this series, not this series, but Jesus' teaching, which is the central part of the series, is what makes Christianity what it is, and actually what makes it what what made it so revolutionary. If you've ever stopped to ask yourself, how did how did a crucified homeless man followed by a bunch of the lowest people in society change the world. This, this is how. And it's long overdue for us to hit back on this, on this core essential foundation of what Jesus says and teaches. So <laughs> we just played a game. <coughs> We just played a game with this ball. For those of you who are going to be watching this on YouTube, you're wondering why there's a ball up here next to me. And um, and it was a great game uh, for me because I got to watch all of you play a game that you don't know the rules to. And you were, people were dropping off like flies because when you break the rules in a game, what happens? You lose, right? You're out or whatever. Right? And that's exactly what that's exactly what unfortunately happened here. And that's a lot of what happens in life. There are rules, and if you don't know the rules, sometimes you get in trouble. I remember my very first time in medical school not being in the classroom but being in the hospital. My first time to set foot in a hospital as a medical student. And my very first day, and I was just following my direct superiors, my residents around, and I was their medical student. And it was the summer, and I did this in my summer holiday. Like I was doing this out of my own volition to get like extra experience um, and an ex, you know, a, an extra um, kind of like exposure, right? And we start. I'm just sitting next to them first thing in the morning at the nursing station, and the head nurse, she looked like somebody big and big and important, turns points her finger right like two inches from my nose and starts shouting at me and, and just reamed me out and walked away, right? And I I was petrified. I, I, I didn't know what I did. I didn't know what I didn't do. I didn't know what it was, but I certainly wasn't ever going to do it again. And I was just terrified, right? And uh, my residents told me, oh, don't worry. She just shouts at everybody and this and that and so on. And, and later on, I learned what the rules are. There's rules that are written, there's rules that are not written, there's rules that apply to only certain people, there's rules that apply to everybody. There's all kinds of different rules. My first time I was in the operating room. So when you, you go in the operating room, you have to go through all certain procedures to be sterile, right? So you don't want to bring bacteria and infection with you into the operating room, cut the guy open, and we introduce all of this nastiness into the patient being operated on, right? So when you, you have to wash your hands in a certain way and this and that, I did everything exactly like I was supposed to do. I walked in, they told me don't touch anything. So I didn't touch anything, right? And, then, and I just stood there, I figured if I stand like a statue, I can't get in trouble. I'll just ask questions. I'll be a statue that asks questions, right? So there you go. So I just stood there like a statue, like this. I got yelled at. Watch your hands. I'm like, I am. They're down here. They're not touching anything, I promise, right? And no, your hands have to be between your nipples and your belly button. That's the only place they can go. Here is dirty. There is dirty. Here is dirty. I don't know. Everywhere is dirty. Where am I supposed to put them, right? And so, and you get, right? And then when you get used to the rules, I mean, eventually I became a surgeon, so I, I figured it out at some point. You know what I mean, right? But all these rules, rules, rules. And if you break the rules, you're out. We've all experienced that in life, and we've all experienced that at home, at work, at the gym. There's always all kinds of different things that we have to do to follow the rules. And there's this board game called The Game of Life by Milton Bradley. You know, unfortunately, life is not a game. Unfortunately, the life that I'm living is not a game, and when people lose, when people lose, they don't always get a chance to play again. And this game has rules, and the game that you are and I are in also has rules. And there's all kinds of rules. 
Actually, the Jewish culture had rules. Not one or two, they had 613 laws. Like if they took all the laws of the Old Testament and they counted them a single time, they didn't count them multiple times, but they counted them just once, um, there would be 613 of them. In addition to that, they had something called the tradition of the elders. That was a separate rule book. That, those were rules were to make sure that you don't break the 613 rules. So they made a rule, like they made a rule as an outer boundary of the rule. So if you never cross the outer boundary, you'll never cross the inside boundary. Then after that, the Pharisees made their own rules. So there were the, rule, the rules of the Pharisees, and then there were the rules of the tradition of the elders, and then there were the laws of God. And oh my goodness, right? All of these different laws, and how can you keep them straight? Of, of course, the average peasant couldn't. So in their time, if if you wanted to learn the rules, you had to find a rabbi who was willing to teach you. And what you would do is you would ask the rabbi if you could be his disciple. And you do that by going and sitting at his feet. This is all very, very relevant. Like if you think about the stories of like Mary who sits at Jesus' feet, the sinful woman who sits at Jesus' feet. To sit at the feet of someone who is named a rabbi was to request to be a disciple. This request was not like, hey, I'd like to learn you know, a tip or trick from you today. No, no, no. This wasn't like, hey, can you tell me a couple of things that are tweetable? No, no, no. This wasn't a sentence or two. This was a lifetime commitment to be the disciple of this person and to learn from them. Did you hear that? This was a lifetime commitment to learn from this rabbi. And most rabbis, because I mean, how many people can you have following you around for, for their whole lifetime, would just shoo them off with their foot like that. That was what usually happened. Unless they saw extreme potential in someone, then they would allow them. They wouldn't say anything to them, and they would teach, even without addressing them, and they would teach, and, and then they would learn. And that's what you see here in this picture. This is a modern day picture of that, and you see this happening to this day, those of us who had the, the privilege of, uh, of uh, visiting uh, the Holy Land uh, about a year ago or so, uh, when we went to the tomb of David, you, that's exactly what we saw. We saw rabbis and in front of them, their disciples, and their disciples reading and learning and discussing and their rabbis correcting them and their rabbis teaching. Right? And all of this is happening in a very small space and there's multiple rabbis and multiple and multiple disciples and it's very noisy, right? And this isn't something this isn't something that was foreign at the time. So I mean this is it's remarkable that Jesus was a rabbi and even more remarkable the people he accepted to be his disciples. And I mean, think about it. To learn 613 laws, at the very least, you're going to need to know how to read, right? So they would teach you how to read, and they would teach you how to write, and they would teach you rhetoric, and they would teach you grammar, and they would teach all of this stuff, and memorization. A lot of education, a lot of education went in to being a disciple. St. Paul was one of these people, and he says that about himself. He says, he says, uh, although I was born in the city of Tarsus in Cilicia, but I was brought up in this city, Jerusalem that is, right? I studied under Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the law of my ancestors. St. Paul went through this from the age of eight years old. He sat at the feet of Gamaliel and learned and learned and learned and learned up until his early 30s when he was commissioned to persecute the church and then later on had his revelation of, uh, of, of Jesus Christ and became a, a follower of Jesus Christ. And in, in the following chapter in Acts 23, he says, men and brethren, I'm a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, right? All of these rules and laws and 613 laws, Jesus narrowed them down for us to two. He narrowed them down to us to two, and then after that, because that was gonna be too complicated for us, he narrowed them down to one. So folks, you and I don't need to memorize 613 laws. We just got to get one right. Man, don't get this one wrong, man. It's the only thing you got to get right. <laughs> you, got, you, you got off the hook for 612. And the tradition of the elders and the Pharisees' rules. And, right? Just get this one. Just make sure 
make sure you got this one. You got this one down. So a lawyer goes to Jesus and he says to him, Rabbi, Rabbi, you know, never heard of you. I never seen you learning. I never seen you saw you sitting as a disciple at any of his feet. I never saw you learning, memorizing, learning how to read, learning how to write. I never saw any of that. But everybody calls you rabbi, so sure, rabbi. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus uh, says to him, "You're the lawyer. What's the law? What's your reading of it?" So, Jesus, so he answers Jesus, and he says to him, "Love the Lord your God." with all your heart and all your soul and all your might, and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says to him, excellent, do this and you will live. Now, the lawyer wants to get himself off the hook, right? He wants to get himself off the hook, so he asks Jesus, he asks Jesus, who is my neighbor? Jesus answers him with a story. Jesus answers him with a story. So he said 613 all narrow down to two. Love the Lord your God with all your whole heart, all your soul, all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And then Jesus tells him a story to answer to him who his neighbor is. He says to him, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came of it where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took two denarii and he gave them to the innkeeper, and he said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was a neighbor to him who fell among thieves? Now, before I tell you the answer of the lawyer, I need to give you some context. Now, Jews and Samaritans didn't exactly get along very well. Samaritans were Jews who figured it was all right to intermarry with the nations. So much so, Jews looked at the, those of Israel, of the northern kingdom, that they were so wicked that God took them away in captivity. Of course. The, the, those in Judea were wicked and God took them away in captivity too, but the ones in the northern kingdom, they never came back. What the emperors did is they said, if we leave the ground empty, we're not benefiting from it. So let's get, but if we leave the people there, they'll start an uprising against us. So look, this is what we'll do. We'll take them away in captivity and we'll take some of our other slaves that we've captured, captured from other nations and bring them there. But we'll leave enough people there so that they who know how to work the land and they know the seasons and they know how things work so that they can make sure things you know we make the most of the, the land but not enough people to start an uprising so they they got other nations that they had captured and they 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 brought them and as slaves to work the ground in the kingdom of israel the northern kingdom all this the kingdom of judea was still maintained still had kings a lot of some of them were good some of them were bad Right, and so the Samaritans started to in, inter the in, intermingle uh, and intermarry, uh, and so the Jews from Judea they didn't consider them Jewish anymore, and they started to worship other gods, which they did anyways before. Right, the whole thing became a really big mess, but they still had some hint of the of the worship of the God of the Jews in them that the Samaritans that is, and some ancestry, some ancestral uh, lineage to them. Right? So the Jews didn't talk to Samaritans. They considered them worse than Gentiles. Right? So this was the treatment of the Jews towards the Samaritans, and for the most part of the Samaritans back towards the Jews. So there was really no relationship between them whatsoever. Now the priest and the Levite, they didn't they didn't they didn't help the guy for whatever their reasons were. But for reasons of ceremonial purity, they couldn't touch blood. 
So this guy who was beaten up and half dead, they couldn't really touch him because they would be breaking like Jewish law. I mean, they could have done a multitude of other things. You know what I mean? They could have they could have gotten somebody to help him. They could have paid for somebody to help him. They could have stopped and waited with him until somebody else comes down the road. And they could have insisted that that person help him. There's a multitude of things they could have done. Or they could have just disregarded the ceremonial laws of purity and helped the man to save his life. You know, and then they have to go through a, they have to go through ceremonies of cleansing once they become ceremonially unclean. But they could have done that to save the guy's life, right? But they don't. Samaritans were to Jews as worse than Gentiles. They were like wolves in sheep's clothing. Like if God wanted to do the world a favor, he would open the earth and make, and make Samaritans disappear. And so Jesus tells this story to this Jewish lawyer. And who's the hero in the story? A Samaritan. Like what Jesus was saying was so counterculture. It was so counterculture that when Jesus asked who showed himself to be a neighbor to this man, the lawyer couldn't answer the question. The lawyer answers and he says, He who showed mercy on him. He doesn't say the Samaritan. He can't let it out of his mouth. That would be like me telling this story and the hero is like, to you, like, is Satan. You know? Like, you wouldn't be able to say, like, the good guy is Satan. Like, you just wouldn't let the word, be able to, you wouldn't be able to get the words out of your mouth. They, when they, when they want to, when they want to curse Jesus, they say, they say, he, he has a demon, or he's a Samaritan. <laughs> like, right? Like, when they want to curse him, like, he's either possessed with a, with an evil spirit, or he's a Samaritan. Right? The lawyer couldn't get the words out of his mouth. Jesus is showing that the hero of the story is the one who had compassion, who had mercy, regardless if he was a Samaritan. If he was a Samaritan or not. Jesus is showing that having fulfilled these two commandments, love the Lord your God, and love your neighbor as yourself, you've really, you've really fulfilled all the other commandments. And disregarding these two, disregarding these two, no matter how ceremonially clean you are, you've achieved nothing. And so another time in reference to these two commandments, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your might, and love your neighbor as yourself, Jesus says, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. As a note, side note, a topic for another day, to love your neighbor as yourself would imply that you love yourself. So there's actually three people we're called to love. God, our neighbor, and ourselves. Otherwise, the standard of loving our neighbor is really low. If you hate yourself, all you have to do is hate your neighbor. That's certainly not what Jesus is talking about. But some of you might be kind of sitting uncomfortably in your seats like, whoa, 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 hold on a second, John. Like, are you just about to just can the other 611 laws of the Old Testament? Like, you know, like, isn't that the word of God? Like, isn't that really important? And so on. Jesus answers that question. And the Beatitudes, right, in, in, in Matthew 5, he answers that question. He says, don't misunderstand why I have come. It isn't to cancel the law of Moses and the warnings of the prophets. No, I came to fulfill them and to make them all come true. With all the earnestness I have, I say, every law in the book will continue until its purpose is achieved. This is the kicker. Its purpose is achieved. Now I want to pause for a second here and tell you how Jesus took it from two commandments and made it one. There's probably nothing you can do. For those of you who know me, I'm a little bit um, embarrassed to say this, especially these days. Those of you who know me well know that uh, I can be given to anger. And 
I can get angry, and when I get angry, I can get really angry. I've told stories before. I've strangled people and all kinds of things. Fortunately, I haven't strangled anybody in years. Um, but, uh, but I still don't trust myself. Um, there's nothing that upsets me more. There's nothing in the universe that upsets me more than when I see somebody hurt one of my children. Biological children or spiritual children. The more vulnerable, the, the more unbearable I find. And the opposite is true as well. Nothing, nothing honors me personally more than when I see somebody honoring one of my children, be it biological children or spiritual children. When I see somebody caring for one of my children, when when one of you travels somewhere where I have friends and I call my friend and I say, hey, my friend so-and-so is traveling, do you mind to just take care of them? And then I never hear back. And then when that person comes back, they become like best friends with my friend who lives somewhere else. And that person picked them up from the airport and fed them dinner and found them a place and like drove them around and took care of them, gave them the five-star white love treatment until it was time for them to leave and they came back. That honors me so much. When someone takes care of my daughters, that honors me so much. And the opposite is true. Oh my goodness, once I misunderstood what one of the preschool teachers in my daughter's nursery said to my daughter. It took all of Mary to hold me back from like ripping her head off, right? Fortunately, I understood correctly before saying anything. There's nothing, there's nothing more priceless to a parent than their child. There's nothing a parent enjoys more than seeing their child cared for by themselves or by somebody else. Jesus says, just hours before he's arrested and then crucified, in his last discourse with his disciples, the night after the Last Supper, I mean, these these are the clincher moments, right? These are the cold notes. These are like, if you're going to forget everything I've taught you for the last three years, just remember this. He says to them, a new commandment I give you. Man, Jesus, we had 613. We don't need a 14th. 614th says to them, a new commandment I give you. That you love one another as I have loved you also love one another. But wait a minute, that's not new. Love one another. I mean, that's basically the uh, second commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. So nothing new there, Jesus. Okay, phew. I thought we had like, you know, I thought we had a new commandment and like, I, I can't even keep the old commandments. So now we have new commandments. You know, man, I'm in trouble. I was in trouble with the old commandments. I didn't need a new commandment in addition, right? So thank God it's just like one of the old commandments. So we just pack up and go, right? Jesus, I, I, I. There's a little word, it's so little, it's so tiny, I think you almost missed it. As. Uh, sorry, Jesus, um, I don't really get it. Like, love your neighbor as yourself, love one another, like, big deal, same, same deal. Uh, uh, uh. The other one was love your neighbor as yourself. This one is love your neighbor, love one another as I have loved you. Disciples don't get it. They don't get it. Give them 12 hours. Give them 12 hours. By Friday afternoon, they'll get it. By Friday afternoon, they'll get it. And when you and I don't seem to get it, all we need to do is look at that Friday afternoon. All we need to do is look at Jesus on the cross, and then we'll get it. Jesus raised the bar. The word as sets the standard. Love one another how much? Um, so if you need 10 bucks, I'd give it to you. So yeah, I love you that much. I love you ten, like 10 bucks worth, uh, $20. Uh, if you need to borrow my car, sure, here are my keys. I like, I love you that much. You need a ride, you know, to the other side of town. It'll take me half an hour. I mean, it'll take me 15 minutes there, but it's gonna take me 15 minutes back, right? So. Take me half an hour. Sure, no problem. I, I love you as much as half an hour of my life. Um, how much? What's the standard? 
How far are you willing to go? Jesus says, you go for your brother, for your sister, as far as I went for you. Jesus says, love one another as I have loved you. But my brother is a jerk, but my brother sinned against me seven times seven, says Peter. How many times do I have to forgive him? Jesus says, St. Peter says seven times. Jesus says seven times seven. Seven times seventy. I can't remember. Anyways, to them it was a really big number. He told them something with, which was beyond their arithmetic table, you know? Something beyond their multiplication table. They were fishermen. They couldn't multiply seven times seven. You know, they couldn't go that far. They could count by five. That was it, right? Love one another as I have loved you. This is everything. Because if you love each other the way I have loved you, you honor me. It honors me. It honors me that you love one another. It changes the world for me when I see you loving each other. Not any kind of love. The kind of love that goes the whole way. So your friend needs some money. How much should you lend him? everything he needs. If your friend needs a ride somewhere, how far should you take him? As far as he needs to go. As far as the cross. And scripture gives us a multitude of examples. We're going to examine three and the two in the coming weeks. Short series, we'll just do this for three weeks. But we could go on and on and on forever. Here's one just for fun. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. When do you know you've loved your, your wife enough, husbands? This, this is enough. When you give yourself for her. That's the bar. Jesus raised the bar on us. The bar is not yourself anymore. The bar is not as far as you can go anymore. The bar is as far as Christ can go. So how are you going to jump as high as Jesus can? The only way is going to be by holding on to his coattails. Because I can't jump that high. I'm telling you all right now, I cannot love you as much as Jesus did. But that's what he's asking of each and every one of us. So the only way we're going to be able to do that is if we hold on to him. Just a quick story. There was a, a, a monk living in the desert named St. Peshoy. And in an apparition, he heard that the Lord Jesus Christ would appear on a mountain. So he told all the other monks, and they all woke up very early that day on the designated day, and they started racing up the mountain. And an old man sitting at the bottom of the mountain was asking for help, for somebody to help him up the mountain. So St. Peshoy, the elder of all of those monks, says to him, okay, I'll help you. So just jump on my back. So he's an old man carrying an older man up the mountain. And all the young monks are saying, sorry, sir, I, don't, I would love to help you. I just don't have time right now. I will come back and I'll be right back. But something really big is happening right now that I can't miss. Everybody skirts around him. St. Peshoy says, somebody's got to help him, right? So puts him on his back. And as he's going up the mountain, the guy, the frail little old man who he was able to carry, starts getting heavier and heavier and heavier. And at one point, St. Peshaw, who's an elderly man himself, says, I don't think I can do this anyway. Shouts up to him, sitting on, on his back. He says, I don't think I can carry you anymore. I mean, I don't know. I just, I just can't do this anymore. And, and he looks over and he sees the nail prints in his hand. It was Jesus himself disguised as an elderly poor man who was asking for help. The appearance of Jesus at the top of the mountain was Jesus disguised in the poor. Another time, St. Peshoy is sitting in a cell, minding his own business, praying, and he hears a knock at the, at the door. And he sees, a, he sees another poor man who's traveling through the desert. He says to him, he says to him sir, what, what are you doing? He says, I'm traveling through the desert. He says to him, are you lost? He says, yeah, I must be or something. I asked some of the other monks if they could take me in for the night because I don't know the desert and I don't know the ways of the desert. But, but 
none of none of them none of them had time. He says, "Come, come, come in, come in." And he brings him in, and he sits him down, and he sees he's all crusted and dirt and dust, and so he starts washing his feet. And as he's washing his feet, he sees the nail prints in his feet. He looks up, and it's the Lord Jesus Christ, and he blesses him. He tells him, "Blessed are." Yeah, Father John, I mean, these stories are like 1,600 years old. This is from the, you know, from the 3rd and 4th centuries. Like, I mean, does this stuff still happen today? It does. In the late 20th century, there was a lady who was called, she was so poor, so insignificant. We actually don't know what her name is. She was named after her son, which was a common thing to do. They, they, they called her Umm Abd Sayyid. Her son's name was Abd Sayyid, so they would call the mother by the name of her son, her eldest son. Um Abdusayyid. She loved the poor and cared for the poor, although she herself was very poor. She had nothing, but she, anything she had, she would give it to people. She would go beg in the streets to get something to give it to somebody. She'd say, this, this is a new mother, and she's new, and she needs clothes for her child, and she'd beg in the streets for children's clothes. When everybody knows she's an elderly woman, why are you begging in the streets for children's clothes? Everybody thought she was crazy. And she would take the clothes and go give them to the young mother as a gift. She didn't care about her dignity. Three times the Lord Jesus Christ appeared to her. She washed his feet. She met him at a train station and a third apparition, I can't remember. All of them disguised and poor. All of them the story of the Good Samaritan. All of them being called to love the whole way not ask questions and just go the distance and pray to God to give you the strength to do it. St. James talks about the perfect law, the law of liberty. This is the perfect law. This is the law which is perfect. It achieves all else. If we simply love every single person as Christ disguised in that person, the rich and the poor, the person with a thousand friends and the lonely, the person with a great position and the person with none. If we refuse to be partial, if we refuse to discriminate, to just treat everybody exactly the same, exactly as though we were speaking to Jesus himself, that is the perfect law. That is the law of liberty. Why is it the law of liberty? Because it sets you free from all the other laws. You don't need to go and sit at the foot of a disciple for your at the foot of a rabbi for your life and learn 612 other laws and the tradition of the elders and the Pharisaic rules. And, and you don't need to. You don't need to. Because this sets you free from all of that. But St. James is, 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 he knows, he knows exactly what's going to happen when we, when, when, I, when we say this, right? He says that he knows that you're, you're going you're gonna to feel convicted while you're sitting there. You're going to remember the person that you treated with disdain or the person you were impatient with or the person, you're, and in your heart, you're going to say, man, I shouldn't have done that. Next time I meet this person, I am going to honor them the way I would honor Jesus. And you're, you're convicted and you're sure of it. And you're determined that this is what you're going to do. Because, hey, this is great. You've just given me a free ticket. You've just given me a free ticket. All I have to do is this one thing. What better deal are you going to find than that? And you're sure and you're convinced. And you're going to get up and go. And you're going to forget everything. Saint, that's what St. James tells us. And he says, but if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, Sets you free from everything else. Folks, this is a game changer. Christianity is not about rules. It's about relationship. Relationship with who? Jesus. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Jesus. Everywhere I look, all I see is Jesus. This is a game changer. No more rules. No more rules. No more playing a game that has rules that you don't know what they are. That's what we started with. And everybody lost because you don't know what the rules are. So you can't win. No more of that. No rules. Relationship. Relationship with 
Jesus. Everywhere I look, I see Jesus. This person asks something from me, I'll do it because I'm doing it for Jesus. This person needs help and they didn't ask me. I'm due for them because it's, a, it's an honor to do something for him who did everything for me. This person is overwhelmed and burdened and I can help them out. I'll do it for Jesus. It's a game changer. If your Christianity is about rules and what you did and what you didn't do, you still haven't got this. That's okay. It took me about 30 years. You're probably a lot of you younger than me. You're probably far ahead of me. This changes everything. Why do you come to church? Why do you make it to church? Are you late? Are you early? I don't care. I really don't. Are you coming to meet Jesus? When you go to work tomorrow morning, are you going to meet Jesus? When you have that annoying colleague that sits a cubicle away from you and is always making noise, are you going to love him and be patient with him? Because that's Jesus disguise. That's Jesus in disguise. Yes or no? Don't forget. St. James is referencing something here. I didn't put the whole passage, but it's very interesting. I talked about it before. Apparently, human beings have such a deeply uh, construed sense of self. We have a, such deep self-identity, whether we're aware of it or not. Most of us probably are not aware of it. That when we look at ourselves in the mirror, we only remember what we saw in the mirror for a very short period of time. And then we revert back to remembering what what we believe about ourselves. So, for example, for example, if I tried something on, I tried my favorite shirt on and all of a sudden it doesn't fit, fit quite right, so I take it off and I put it back. I may quickly forget and like three days later try the same shirt on again. Like, and I didn't lose 40 pounds in between. So there's no logical reason to think that all of a sudden it'll fit, right? But why do we do that? Because I have an image of myself that I, of what I look like, of who I am. Animals don't have this. Apparently that's why animals, like pets or whatever, when they, a dog looks in a mirror, he always thinks he's seeing another dog, so he tries to play with the dog in the mirror. Babies, when they're really small, they haven't developed a sense of self. But human beings, we quickly forget what we saw and revert to what we think. And St. James is saying this is exactly what we do. When we look into the perfect law of liberty that sets us free, if we don't do what it says, quickly we forget and we revert back to the image that we have in our mind. Jesus says, if you do this, if you love one another as I have loved you, so you shall love one another. The next verse is, by this everyone will know you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Being a Christian is not a bumper sticker. Being a, a Christian is not a set of rules. Being a Christian is not... Uh, and I, you know, I'm part of this church or that church. Sure, there are denominations and sure there are reasons, historical reasons for why they exist and all of that. And I'm not putting any of that down. And we have a beautiful faith and a beautiful rites and rituals and traditions. Yes, all of that is great. But not, none of that makes you a recognizable Christian. What makes you recognizable as a Christian is if you have love for one another. Imagine with me for a moment. Actually, before you imagine with me for a moment, some of our servants help me to make these handouts. We're just, I'm just going to ask um, a couple of people to help pass them out. Um, if you're anything like me, maybe you're, maybe you're far better than I am. I, I hear things like this, and they get stuck in my head, which is good. Maybe I don't forget them. But they also get stuck in my head. What I mean is they get in my head and they stay in my head. So I challenge you. I challenge you to write four names down on this little card that was handed out to you right now. I challenge you to write four little names on that card. And we printed it on cardstock on purpose so it would be hard to lose. So if you put it in, your, in a book or your Bible or whatever, you will find it this week. And I challenge you to try to love just four people the way Jesus tells us to love. 
I challenge you, I challenge you to write down four names. Think of four people that you're bound to meet this week. People at work, people at home, your family, your neighbors, your, somebody you're going to speak to. Maybe you won't see them in person. Maybe you'll see them on the phone. I challenge you to try to love just four people this week the way Jesus says. And by the end of the week, I want you to, to just find one person in your life. Could be your family. Could be a friend, could be somebody you're close to, could be an accountability partner, your roommate, whoever, and tell them how this experiment went. Tell them what changed. What do you think would change? Imagine with me right now. What do you think it would change in the world if you and I actually did this? If this wasn't a sermon on Sunday, folks, this is too simple to be a sermon. There's like, there's nothing to say. Love one another like Jesus loved you. Period. We're done. We can go home. That's it. There's no more to say. This isn't a sermon to be heard. This is something to be lived. Imagine with me for a moment. Close your eyes. Just imagine me with me for a moment. What this week will look like. Imagine going into work tomorrow morning, going into school, going into wherever, whatever you're going to do tomorrow morning or tomorrow afternoon, whenever. You're going to meet other human beings. And every time you look up at this person, you see a crowd of thorns. Every time they reach their hand out to you to shake your hand, you see the print of the nails there. Every time you're about to lose your patience, you see them hanging from the cross for you, not for themselves. What does that change? Now imagine that you treat them exactly the way you would treat Jesus. What do you think their response will be? How do you think this will transform your own personal relationships with people? Your one-on-ones. Now just for a second, just for a second, imagine if that person treated you that way too. Now we can't expect that from somebody who doesn't know Jesus. But imagine in your home if you treat spouse, you treat your roommate, you treat your friend this way, and they treat you this way back. Imagine if it turns into a competition of submission, a competition of surrender. Who can do the dishes first? Who can clean up after the other and themselves first? Who can wake up and make breakfast for the other person first? Not because I want to be better, because I love you. Man, I owe you my life. The least I can do is wake up and make you a cup of coffee. Imagine what this week could actually look like. Now take it a step further. We can't expect this of all of society. But imagine if every time you stepped in through the doors of this church, all you met every moment were people who wanted to treat you as though you selflessly died for them. People who wanted to treat you like Jesus, and you wanted to do the same. What would that make?